And now, time to get in the huddle with your host, Charles Prodger Ritchie, here on the Mass Steel Podcast. Hey, you blink, I'll cut your eyelids off. Don't you blink. Let's go. You get where you feel like you can rush the quarterback. You understand? Rush the quarterback. Do you have room in the trophy for another one there? You got six of them. Now you're the winningest franchise in NFL history. We'll make room. And welcome once again, everybody, to another edition here of the Mass Steel Podcast. Well, of course, here's truly Charles Prize of Richie here, uh, which you can follow me here on social media, on Twitter, at Mass Steel CGR. Man of Steel podcast on Instagram it is at Man of Steel Nation. Uh, definitely getting some stuff right now. Just a recap once again. Remember, uh, Dave DeCastro no longer is Steelers. He was released on Thursday, as uh, we found out. And it sounded like it was a non-football injury. Uh, said he was having uh, ankle issues uh, recently. And uh, definitely could have kept him months. Uh, Question is, uh, too, will you consider retiring as well? And now you got, like, the newly acquired right guard for the Steelers at this point in time, and Trey uh, Turner here. Uh, Trey Turner, he's definitely been puzzled with a few injuries to the last uh, three seasons. But, like I said, the only first impressions I'm getting off this guy right now is that he could probably be a help in the running game. The only concern is right now, as pointed out by uh, one of the many people in in the media, uh, more particular, host of 93.7, the fan, the Pony Miller Show, and it's Philip Pony. Uh, you can follow him on Twitter at the Pony Express. Uh, basically, he was uh, found out from an insider too. Uh, more relates to uh, Trey uh, Turner was that he was terrible last year when he wasn't in- injured. The biggest impact he was making on games was by taking horrible penalties. Just to give you an idea. And for the most part, when we look at a guy like Trey Turner right here, who's a five-time pro bowler uh, in his uh, career, uh, he went to the Super Bowl with the Carolina Panthers back in 2015 when they had that 15-1 uh, regular season record. Almost went undefeated right there. But, I mean, one of them there, I mean, they lost in the Super Bowl anyway uh, to a very good uh, defense and the Denver Broncos, which was Peyton Manning's last as, as a Bronco right there in his NFL playing career. And you, you saw what happened in 2015, just to give you a sample size break there. I mean, uh, in the run game in particular, uh, they were second overall, uh, racking up 2,282 yards, averaging, averaging nearly 143 yards a game, uh, which is one of the biggest things right there. Uh, the biggest uh, issue I, I take right there, too, is the sacks uh, that have been giving up. I mean, so you got like this new wave of the offensive lines we have been looking for out the off season, including starting from the end of 2019. I mean, there just seems to be a lot of stuff here at hand where we got to be a little bit more uh, concerned with because when we really break this thing down and dissect it a little bit further right now, I mean, you know, everyone knows Ben Rosberg's relationship with this offensive line. I mean, and how he's able to get some chemistry going. I think the interesting thing is right now, this is going to be uh, his second season back from elbow surgery, first full off season of rest. Remember, him and Cam Hayward have been participating in mini camp uh, right here. As we uh, look at it uh, from uh, this standpoint, uh, for right now, uh, listen, I, I think chemistry of this offense line is going to be huge. Uh, right now as we look at things because one of the things we got going on right now I mean looking at too uh, Brooke Parr was saying too with uh, David Castle's release Steelers will have one returning star on the offensive line uh, choose to core for more than likely he's going to be moving to left tackle from a spot on right tackle uh, last off season Uh, remember uh, left tackle that was occupied by Alejandro uh, Villanueva so right here, I mean, you're looking at it right now. Let's break down the offensive line once again, just to remind folks, uh, people just want to refresh your memories. 
I mean, you got Kevin Dotson right here. I mean, who I expect to be the left guard. I think he's been the only solid, legitimate piece as far as new kids on the block uh, trying to protect Ben Rausberger, trying to get some running uh, lanes established. Obviously, I mean, he, he didn't do as much, but I think he did a good job. I mean, helping keep Ben protected. I mean, the Steelers were number one, the most uh, fewer sacks allowed. So, I mean, that's a good sign. But right now, I mean, how much is a guy right now like David DeCastro, a guy who's been a two-time All-Pro, six Pro Bowls, did not win a Super Bowl championship? Yes, of course. But he's been in the league uh, nine seasons. And we look at David DeCastro, I mean, for the most part, I mean, it has only been, I mean, the, the worst amount of starts he's had uh, as a starter was last year where he started 13 out of 13 games. And uh, I mean, I mean, I would say that was a little bit of an eye opener. But, I mean, when you hear some of the stuff that he was trying to play through, I mean, especially I think with the ankles and stuff, I mean, at the end of the day, he did his job to keep him on his feet. My the biggest question I did pose on the last show was that will more sex uh, be uh, surrendered right now? The chemistry, but you, you look at it like a little bit further too. No more Marquise Pouncey right now. So is that going to be uh, BJ Finney or more likely Kendrick Green? And remember with BJ uh, Finney right there, who's the guy who uh, fumbled the ball when Mason Rolf was in there, uh, had shoulder injury, and he was done for the season at that point. The, I mean, BJ Finney, I think for the most part, I mean, when we uh, look at him too as well, I mean, Finney, I, I don't think was as bad. Unfortunately, I think he does have that blemish he's got to wear on him as a Steeler, and you look at him and his uh, career here, I mean, yeah, I mean, he was uh, last with uh, the Bengals and the Seahawks. But still, I, I mean, I thought he did a, a decent job, I mean, for the most part. I mean, he played in 13 games in uh, 2016. The most he's, pl he's played 16 games in, in 2019. He was only able to start four, but still – uh, listen, I, I think Finney is still not a bad uh, transitional piece for this line as uh, we look at it. So I'd like to hear your thoughts right now. Uh, feel free to hit me up. Uh, leave me a comment. Uh, you can also, like, uh, if you guys are tuning into the Mass Steel Podcast, feel free to tune in. You can just search the Facebook page, Mass Steel Podcast, if you guys want to leave a like. Feel free. And if you guys ever want to follow it uh, by following through an at uh, handle, uh, you can just definitely look up at Man of Steel Nation uh, for the most part. So that's where we're uh, at right now as far as this goes on. And one of the questions, too, I think a lot of people were like looking at, too, because uh, I think the Steelers. Uh, did get a little bit of hot water with not reporting Ben Roethlisberger's uh, elbow injury right away. That was one of the things that was brought up by Rod Cook and Joe Starkey. And so I remember, I think the cap savings on this was going to be about like over eight and a quarter, eight and three quarter million dollars uh, with that release that happened. I'm going to go ahead and double check that as we uh, go along uh, for the most part. Yeah, $8.75 million uh, they will be saving. He was going to be due to have a $14.3 million cap hit, just to recap, uh, for the Steelers' uh, salary. And now that he is gone right now, will David DeCastro challenge this right now? Will there be, like, uh, some sort of, like, a uh, hearing on this uh, and uh, see – uh, if they want to, like, uh, like if he's going to be needed to be compensated, because uh, if it's non football injury related, I mean, when we uh, look at, because remember, he played for the double injury uh, last season and appeared to have recently suffered an ankle injury. Uh, and uh, that, that'd be really uh, wondersome right there. And, but the, the only thing was, when he did try fixing it uh, a year ago, uh, as far as the ankle, the bone spurs kept coming back. 
He said Nagy, he said Nagy pretty bad all last year. He was never on the injury report for the ankle. He was on it for knee, hand, abdominal, and not injury related. So I think the Steelers right now are just trying to be in compliance with the league, uh, make sure they're not getting any hot water. If there's any kind of injury, you have to report. Got to do your diligence right there. And I would anticipate that, I mean, being the case right now as we uh, move a little bit forward on this right now uh, for the time being. So, uh, and like I said, I, I think my biggest takeaway, I mean, when we look at like uh, Trey Turner, let's just uh, go to the flip side on that right now. Uh, I mean, he's made uh, only nine starts a year ago when he was last with the LA Chargers in uh, SoFi Stadium, uh, especially when he played in that area with the Chargers. Uh, here's his injury history from what I looked up on Wikipedia. Uh, 2017, he missed the final three games uh, due to a concussion. Uh, 2018, he missed two weeks and three due to a concussion, week 17 due to an ankle. Now, at a point, too, I mean, Trey Turner, uh, for the most part, in his uh, NFL, I mean, career, like, after his team uh, made the Super Bowl, despite losing, com coming runner-up uh, to the Broncos, uh, and, and a year later, after they missed the playoffs, but following that offseason, 2017, uh, he signed a four-year, $45 million contract extension with $20.5 million guaranteed. Uh, he started 13 games at right guard before missing the final three games with the as I mentioned. He did return in the wild card round of the playoffs. Uh, but, but still, I mean, I mean, he he earned his second consecutive uh, Pro Bowl in uh, 2016. And uh, definitely he was one of the most uh, respected uh, guards in the league right there. And I mean, definitely a guy at the top of his game. Like I said, I, I only get concerned with right now is Ben Ross we're gonna feel comfortable. He's gonna be able to adapt right now. I mean, he's still got like question marks too across his offensive line right now. I mean, Zach uh Banner, I mean, which uh by the way, too, I mean, he got injured in the very uh first game of the season. I mean, with the Steelers, I mean, basically. And, uh, yeah. I mean, you got you to gotta wonder if, like, uh, this guy could be able to stay uh, healthy. I mean, for the most part. I mean, when, when we looked at, I mean, uh, when he suffered a knee injury in the opener on the road against the Giants. I, I like his enthusiasm. I like his drive. Don't forget, he did beat out, I mean, by the way, too. I mean, for that position, I think Chooks a core for, I mean, for that uh, tackle position, right tackle. I mean, I, I, like, I like his effort. I love his drive. But he still hasn't really proven much to me just yet. Availability is going to still be very key for this guy right here. Alejandro Villanueva, say what you will. I mean, some of the funky stuff, I mean, the last few years, as far as, like, doing stuff as team on the field. I, I, and no offense. I mean, I love Alejandro Villanueva. Very respected. Maybe you also got the sense of, too, people kind of took him for granted, in my opinion. I really do feel like he was taken for granted. Uh, for what he did on this offensive line. I mean, he was uh, definitely uh, very key. I mean, obviously, he didn't really help much with the run game. But, I mean, he, that, that, that can, that's going to be a guy that's going to be uh, hard to replace, in my opinion. We'll see how they uh, do right there. But I think the hugest one definitely is going to be without uh, life without Marquise Pouncey right now. I mean, not just for Ben Rosberg, but whoever steps in as a quarterback, whether it's Mason Ruff or Dwayne Haskins. As quarterback now, we're going to find out this preseason how it relates who will be the number two guy on the depth chart behind Big Ben. So my, my uh, final takeaway and thoughts right now, uh, listen, I don't think the Steelers did do the Castro dirty. I mean, at the same time, I mean, if anything, listen, I mean, it's a lot of pressure right there. 
you don't want to be missing games. I can understand from that standpoint, but how much was he hiding and not opening up to coach Mike Tomlin and of course uh, medical and training staff on that team. So did he slit his own throat in a way? Quite possible. We'll see. But uh, hopefully uh, he'll be able to get a successful surgery. I, I would like to see him have a few more years left. I mean, too bad for right now. It's not going to be with the Steelers. So let's go ahead and like uh, start uh, moving on right now uh, with this. Because I, I do like Trey Turner. I think Trey Turner will be an immediate impact with the run game. But protecting Ben Rosberger, let's find out. Uh, another thing we're looking at, too, I mean, right now, I mean, with part of the Steelers' success that's really uh, kept them alive in the contention, I mean, the last few years, it has definitely been uh, this defense right here. The defense, I mean, for the last uh, two seasons in particular, after her having a horrific, uh, I mean, wh when you looked at it back in uh, 2018, they only had 15 uh, takeaways, which was seven, let's see, eight interceptions, seven fumble recoveries. Not, not good. But in 2019, you saw what the difference, I mean, with guys like starting number one with Steven Nelson, a guy who is still looking for a job right now. Uh, one team that was uh, apparently interested that really could use the secondary help but it's not for sure just yet is the uh, Philadelphia Eagles. I mentioned NFC East team. Uh, they are a team right now under Nick Sirianni right now who are going to be looking at to improve that uh, core right there. But speaking with the Steelers right now, I mean, you, you look at Steven Nelson, how wonderful he was able to play alongside uh, Joe Hayden. And of course, I mean, the biggest obvious uh, difference maker was, I mean, Patrick too. I mean, getting this guy a year later. I mean, the day, the day after they had, I mean, the day they announced that Ben Rosper would be having season ending surgery on this throwing elbow. But when you look at like uh, what him and Hayden have been able to do, I mean, collectively and uh, playing together, I mean, back in 2019, I mean, Steven Nelson and uh, Hayden combined for uh, six interceptions as far as like the core cornerback. Uh, unit and then in 2020 uh, a year later uh, when we uh, took a look at it I mean they had uh, four interceptions Gary so uh, takeaways the last two seasons I mean which was pretty darn special right there I mean if anything when, when you look at I mean where this translated into the team right now I mean, right now, you're going to be going with uh, Cam Sutton right now. Uh, Cam Sutton, which, by the way, uh, who was uh, taken, let's see here, uh, uh, back in the 2017 NFL draft, uh, third-round pick, 9th overall. Uh, I mean, when you look at him, I mean, what he's been able to do, I mean, he's had an interception each of his uh, years coming off, but, I mean, this is one guy, I mean, I think the Steelers, uh, affordable they could do with. I mean, they had to do cut ties with Steven Nelson. Of course, with the COVID-19 uh, cap affecting everybody, especially the Steelers' uh, pocketbook, as far as trying to free up space here and what they could do. I mean, remember, let's not forget, I mean, largely due to the pandemic, we already knew the Steelers, a lot of teams were going to be in a, um, in a hole uh, for teams that are pressing against the cap I mean, did an amazing job. I mean, uh, fixing this, getting this corrected, if you ask me. But Stephen Nelson, at the end of the day, he was going to be a cap uh, casualty, unfortunately, the way the business uh, goes. Because I uh, remember a month ago, back in middle of May, it was reported uh, by ESPN senior NFL reporter uh, Jeremy Fowler that uh, Stephen Nelson's uh, market has been strong since becoming a free agent. Uh, he has interest in her from 14 teams, including the Texans, Bears, Eagles, Bengals, and Bills, as he continues to patiently uh, wait for the right fit and opportunity. And, uh, and as an article that was written by Fanside, the Eagles, like I was just alluding to right now, they're the main team that is uh, interested in them. Um, I mean, when you look at their situation right now, I mean, the Eagles will finish 
four, 11 and one. I uh, have that tie against the Bengals uh, last year. I mean, the, the addition of the veteran uh, Nick Roby Coleman in the slot did more harm than good. And Avante Max, he continued to struggle finding a solidified role for himself in the secondary. He also had undrafted free agent uh, Michael Jacket uh, showed signs of promise last season, but also had one of the worst defense performances in league history when matched up against the likes of Michael Gallup during the team's Week 16 loss to Dallas. And one of the things that's uh, the the holdback that has been you know the big trigger in the claw is why the Eagles haven't signed them right now. Uh, Steve Nelson and his agent they, and his team of people they want to at least be compensated somewhere between the neighborhood of four or five uh, million dollars. And whereas you got like Howard Howie Roseman right now, he wants to pay at least a half of that, uh, which could probably be a little bit of an issue right there. Uh, listen, I forgot like Steven Nelson, and you look at like uh, the Eagles uh, cap situation, by the way, let's go over to cap.com. I mean, take a look at uh, their cap space right now uh, for, for the time being. The Eagles right now at this uh, point, let's see what they got. Uh, they are right now about almost $2.8 million in cap space. That's the problem right there. So you're going to have to like find a way to make some moves on the roster. I'm going to ask a few people to take a pay cut or release a person or two on there. As you uh, look at it right there for that team, I mean, for the time being right now, I mean, he, he is a executive vice Say vice president of football operations, but still, listen, a guy like Steven Nelson will be worth it, in my opinion. I think, if anything, for the Eagles right now, it's going to be having to figure out their offense. I, th- I think it's more than anything right now. I mean, their offense right now, which has been kind of like a little bit uh, suspect as well, we saw brutally last year. I mean, they, they were uh, 14th. I mean, the last, I mean, they were 14th when he had uh, Carson Wentz until he got injured in the playoffs. And then uh, 14th of the year, they were fighting the Super Bowl. And 2017, uh, when they had that uh, dream season right there, up until Carson Wentz got hurt, yet had and Nick Foles still managed a respectable uh, seven total yards, uh, but still was able to hold on the four, win the Super Bowl for that team. Uh, listen, I, I know it's pressed up against the wall, but I think offense would be the number one thing right now. I mean, yeah, you need the help in the secondary, but I think you need to get back to like uh, getting some establishment right now uh, as we uh, take a look at, I mean, for that Eagles team. Because uh, right now, I mean, when we take a look at their starters and uh, their roster, basically, I mean, for the time being, I mean, who else – Got on here. Uh, aside from that, I mean that that is going to be a real interesting uh, thing right there. So they try and have life beyond that, and just just try and get some uh, life breathed back into this team here. I mean the Philadelphia Eagles, for the most part, as uh, we look at it, I mean Jalen uh, hurts right now. I mean, who's drafted in the second uh, round in the 2020 uh, draft, uh, coming out of Alabama and Oklahoma. Uh, that, 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 that is a huge transition right now, a huge follow-up right now. I mean, uh, Doug Pearson, he is out of the picture right now as we look at it. But, I mean, I, I really like to see, I mean, what they got uh, cooking right now. I mean, I think offensive defense. But I can understand why money situation, it would not make sense. But as far as the other teams that were mentioned in here, uh, when we look at teams that were still uh, looking at a guy like uh, Steven Nelson, I mean, you look at, I could see one that could fit right now, probably be the Chicago Bears. I mean, Chicago Bears, I mean, right here in Chicago, I mean, if you ask me, that's what's made their season uh, very special not last year, but the season before that, 
uh, when they, I mean, two years prior to the 2020 season, I'm talking about 2018, Matt Nagy's first year. I mean, when you look at what they did, I mean, collectively as an effort right there, I mean, on the defensive uh, side uh, right there, the Chicago Bears uh, were number one in uh, takeaways with uh, 36, which included 21 interceptions, which was number first. I mean, number one in the league. Then you look at the next uh, two years, the interceptions, it went to uh, 20. Uh, it was uh, ranked uh, 25th in the league with only 10 interceptions. When you had, I mean, as a team the year before, they had 20, they had 27 interceptions, which was ranked number one. And then in 2019, 10, which is pretty much cut in half, 25th in the league. And then last year, too, uh, with the picks, they only had 10 interceptions, which was ranked 23rd, same number. So, I mean, you already got some confidence uh, breathing right now, uh, right now with Justin Fields right now. I mean, they got, they feel like they got a quarterback right there. And you got like a decent team. You got an offensive line building around right now. I still say that's the, I mean, as long as you got like a guy like Khalil Mack, who was ranked as number one edge rusher according to Pro Football Focus, who was still one of the key cornerstone pieces on that team, what's left of that defense, they need to get back to find the ways to take a, take great turnovers. So if anything, I think the Chicago Bears will make a lot of sense for a guy like Steven Nelson. Uh, the, and when we look at like the Bears uh, cap situation right now, and you look at a team right there who's, who's got right now, they're, they're, they'll be pushing it close. So you may have to make some adjustments to some contracts. I mean, right now they are close to $6 million, over four, $5.9 million in cap space to be exact. So, I mean, right now, listen, how bad you really want to make a Super Bowl run right now if you're the Bears right out here in the Windy City? I think uh, that would be a team that makes a whole lot of sense right now. And the, and the only thing is, too, I mean, with him being released, I mean, as a Steeler uh, fan or perspective, you don't want to see him go on our team in the conference, too. I think that's another thing we need to watch out for. I mean, if you're the Steelers, because remember, the other teams – that were uh, mentioned too, like I was uh, saying right now, I, I don't think you want to see him go to the Bengals right there. That was one of the other teams. Uh, the Bills, I, I'm not sure if I like that idea. Because remember, week one, you open up on the road in Buffalo, by the way. So how would you like that? I mean, let's, let's, just, let's just think about that for a few seconds right there. So... Right now, I mean, as the longer Steve Nelson continues to uh, look, the Steelers continue to make the most sense for him. They got over $50 million in cap space right now. Uh, you still got to pay T.J. Watt. But maybe, just maybe, I mean, maybe that's just the holdup right there. Just trying to figure out how they're going to, like, take care of a guy who would be commanding about nearly $30 million per year and, like, uh, cap money. I mean, a guy who is definitely worth every penny of it, every dollar, every damn cent. And that, that, that's where you got to look at right there. So, you know what? As long as you, you, could, you could pitch the guy the idea, listen, I mean, like, let's, let's sit down and have a heart-to-heart -heart talk. Uh, sorry, we had to do business right there. I know it was kind of cold and disappointing, but would you be willing to take a lesser role but we'll stay take care of you financially. I mean, I mean, if you could just meet us halfway. The only the only concern I would have about that would this be like an R. James Harrison type of deal right now. I mean, meaning where it's a situation where Mike Tom is insisting that I still got you screen right here. We'll uh, you know, like uh, trust me, uh, just just hang around. We'll have you taken care of. A guy like James Harrison, let's not forget, before he did uh, demand and got his release. And was able to go over to the New England Patriots, go to the Super Bowl despite losing in it. Remember, he did not like the fact that, you know, he was uh, being on the bench a lot of times. He wanted to be able to have his services utilized, get out there on the field if he's not starting, at least just put him to use. Because James Harrison, 
I mean, with his work ethic and all the dedication he's done, his heart, sweat, and soul to that team, he's always wanted to make a, an impact on that defense, uh, which he's uh, continued to do. And for the most part, that's why with Steven Nelson, how do you like, you know, like slot this guy in here right now? You bring him off the bench, uh, you bring him on sub patches here. That that's why I'll be thinking right now. If if I'm the uh, right now, if I'm Keith Butler and the Steelers right now, uh checking with uh Mike Tomlin right now. I mean, that's gotta be the biggest question. How do you like uh put him in there? How you maximize uh his time when you're going with a guy in Cam Sutton right now? The young buck, I mean, of the way. So for the Steelers in that regard right now, uh, I, I, if you were to ask me, I see him returning back to the team. But that's only once they get things figured out with T.J. Watt. And, and for the Steelers, too, uh, let's take a further look with everything right now. I think their cap has already been adjusted uh, since they signed uh, Trey Turner. Let's see. For the most part. Yeah. Signed a one year, uh, three million dollar deal. That was according to the spoke track. Don't check on there. But let me know what you guys think. What do you guys feel? Do you think uh, do you guys see Steven Nelson returning back to the Steelers? Do you think he goes somewhere else? Uh, do you guys, or even, even in the AFC North? Does he go to the Bengals join Mike Hilton? Obviously, I do not want to see that. That would definitely uh, not be uh, a pleasant thing to look forward to. You don't want to take a team like the Bengals for granted and, and overlook them like they did, I mean, late down the season when they were gassing. You got to be very uh, careful with a team like that. So I say he returns to the Steelers. Why not? I just I just don't see it making sense with the Bengals unless I mean him and Mike Hiller are talking. You know, uh, he's making a pitch right now. I mean to the head coach uh, Zach Taylor. And what better way to get even with your opponent and hurt your team is in the division? I don't know. That, I mean that that would just be my mindset from a rivalry standpoint. So as we're uh, staying with her right now here on this Mass Steel podcast, let's get to our next uh, topic for now. Uh, right now, beginning with uh, Dale Lally of uh, DK Pittsburgh Sports right now. Uh, currently, the progression of the Steelers right now uh, with their vaccinations is about 90% uh, right now, despite the fact that they are being denied uh, training camp at St. Vincent College. Uh, that's a lot of things where a lot of people are very uh, ticked off at, very extremely disappointed in right now. Uh, when we look at it, I mean, to say the least, we still have the Cowboys and the Chiefs uh, get their training camps in there. Cowboys are able to go to California, and then the uh, Chiefs, I forget where, but still, I mean, I, I, I don't get it. I mean, it's a head scratcher, too, when you look at, like, how they're handling their vaccinations, too. I mean, getting themselves vaccinated. And, like I said, the only thing I could possibly think of, it's got to be something maybe with Roger Goodell keep the tabs on the governor, Governor Wolf over there. Maybe there's just some things, some uh, I mean, red flags where he doesn't feel the way they handle things during the COVID. I mean, I think they already just had the clearance to get their, uh, have uh, masks being removed. So, I mean, look at it right now, I mean, at this time, and this is where I got to look at just a little bit harder at this point is that for right now it's definitely a bummer well i mean let's just say what it is and it's uh, definitely a shame that fans won't be able to experience that uh in person at latrobe but don't forget too now it's not rule that fans can't attend we gotta wait to hear updates 
uh, come from the Steelers uh, staff. Uh, words at Steelers.com, or if you want to just follow them on Twitter at Steelers. Uh, if you guys want, if you guys want more information on that, remember to check out Missy Matthews too and uh, Teresa Barley. Uh, they're one of the top insiders. Missy Matthews is, of course, the on-field reporter during the games and hosts the Steelers live right there. You can follow her at Missy underscore Matthews right there. One of the top Steelers reporters in there, along with one of the top writers and Teresa Barley. Check them out, or Burt Lawton too, right there, who's one of the who's the Steelers uh, spokesman for the team, uh, as far as like the communications department. And yeah, I, I think that's definitely a shame. I mean, a lot of people feel like right now, once again, it's another case of how the NFL likes to make it har life harder on the Steelers as an organization, where it's uh, cracked now, where it's, I mean, back er a decade ago on the concussions, I mean, well, how the hell it hits, uh, fines. I mean, just uh, awkward stuff right there. I mean, competitive rules on the field. I mean, you know, you could go on and on with the list. Her one person call in uh, 937 The Fan, the Bob Papiani, sh Papiani show uh, this past Saturday, and he was asking, like, well, if the late Dan Rooney was still alive, I mean, would he, would they be allowing this to go down right there? I mean, would he be able to find a way to get training camp back a little troll? But to be honest, yeah, I'm not sure if that will make so much of a difference. I mean, I mean, pretty much taking a swap at, uh, and Art Rooney at the at the end of the day, I, I'm not sure if that's the case right there. But I mean, for the time being, listen, I I don't mind it if if it's got to return back next year. I would like to have it in Latrobe. Love the area, beautiful place to go watch training camp. It was I had a ball. I was down there, and you look at it right there. I mean. I mean, Heinz Field and, of course, the UPMC Sports Rooney uh, Complex got options. I mean, like I said, we have to be on standby just to see what is happening with uh, practice being available for fans to attend. And remember, listen, we still got to just hold, hold our horses just a little bit. And remember, we're barely coming out of COVID. I mean, and, and yes, we are barely starting to have some fans. Uh, come back when it's like in sports right now in the league. I mean, when you, especially just looking at the playoffs right now, I mean, once again, I mean, just starting to see how much of a huge difference to see that live raw fan emotion live and in person. I mean, just cheering on their teams. I mean, you got, I mean, you get, this has been a great, uh, NBA and Stanley Cup playoffs too. I mean, right now, I I really enjoyed it. I mean, when we look outside of football right now, I mean, I mean, look at for instance right now. I mean, the only one that's still got ways to go is like in uh, Canada right now. I mean, Canada's done a fabulous job uh, taking care of their uh, people, uh, their patients. I mean, their medical staff is definitely off the charts. If you if you ask me, but still, I mean, you got like teams like the Canadians. Uh, versus the, the defending Stanley Cup champions right now, Tampa Bay Lightning right now. Tampa Bay Lightning is looking to uh, make it back-to-back -back, uh, Cup's second team in the uh, 21st century, the new millennium, the repeat as champions last since the Pittsburgh Penguins, and which, by the way, if they happen to do repeat, both the Lightning and the Pens will be tied alongside the Chicago Blackhawks with three Stanley Cups in this century, which would be a very impressive uh, feat right there, if you ask me. And, I mean, you got a story right there, too. I mean, Claude Julien, who's no longer the head coach, you got Dominic Ducharme right now, who's uh, coaching that team. And it's uh, definitely some uh, – and, and Mark Bergeron right there, too, a former uh, Chicago Blackhawk right there, who's been part of the front office uh, team. I mean, he's been a, a part of a Stanley Cup – contribution back in 2010 he didn't become manager to the 2011-2012 season but still I mean you look at like some of the stuff right there and then you also look inside the NBA right now I mean you still got like you got the the Bucks who just defeated the Atlanta Hawks at Atlanta right there uh very very good atmosphere in Atlanta I, I love what they're doing with the Hawks uh and their chemistry right there under head coach Nate McMillan right there and then Giannis Antetokounmpo right now will this finally be his year to break through and get that 
elusive NBA championship ring that we look at right now. And uh, that's what I'm looking at. I mean, for the most part. So, listen, I think for right now, uh, and then you got the Suns right now trying to fend off the Clippers, trying to advance to the NBA Finals. Their first ever NBA Finals since 1993, where they were upended by uh, Goran and the Bulls, where they actually three-peated. So, I mean, you look at stuff right there. I mean, it's just still great. I mean, basketball and hockey playoffs. And it's a head scratcher, yes, for, I mean, Steelers fans not to have that experience in Latrobe and St. Vincent College. But like I said, I mean, Steelers Nation, let's just uh, step back, take a deep breath. I mean, as much as I want to see it back, better safe than sorry. I mean, what would you rather have? I mean, no offense. I mean, there's just certain things we got to learn to be patient with. And to be honest, I don't think I want to go back in my car or while I'm working out hearing more news of positive tests uh, spiking. I mean, positive tests. It's just not worth that anymore. It really isn't. And I understand the frustration on that. Let's go into some other uh, stuff right here, too. I mean, uh, on this uh, Monsteel podcast right now, Ed Bouchette, he wrote a very beautiful uh, article I got a chance to look at before I went on the air here. Uh, which he uh, written uh, basically just uh, recapping the Pittsburgh Steelers uh, Super Bowl 40 team and, and where they uh, definitely beat a lot of odds right there. A lot of characters, a lot of adversity they had to face, remember. I mean, you think about, I mean, a lot of stuff that went out right there. I mean, just flashback the year before, uh, Ben Brownsburg's rookie year. And um, Jerome Best was definitely the take was starting to run on empty for uh, his NFL career. Uh, I mean, they went 15-1 and one that season. I mean, Ben Browns were going, I think, 13-0 and 0 in his uh, first season. And then you looked at it right there, too. I mean, uh, they won a close battle against the New York Jets, uh, winning that in sun death and overtime, but only lose once again to the New England uh, Patriots in the playoffs for the second time within four seasons. And that was about a time right there. I mean, Jerome Best, I mean, like about shortly after that, I think like the next day, I uh, had a conference with his locker room and was just saying, you know what, listen, I think I'm going to have to hang it up. And then, man, I, there was just a lot of people who were just uh, devastated, including like Heinz Ward. I just remember like it was just yesterday. I was at home reading the paper. I was looking at it. And I just, I just could not believe what was going on right there. And it was just sad. I, I felt like crying with those guys. It just, it just couldn't be the way you want it to end. Unfortunately, we don't have things go our way a lot like that. But, I mean, for that group of character right there, I mean, the following season, and for Joel Best to thankfully realize that the Super Bowl wasn't be in his hometown, Detroit, he wanted to seize an opportunity right there. Uh, give it one more chance and did not want to send the sideline with regret and that like his team is in the Super Bowl and he's not on that team. I mean, he got it up. He came back with that. Remember, I think he had like a, a leg injury. I mean, uh, during preseason where he was sidelined for a couple of games uh, before uh, starting the regular season. But still, I mean, that right there, I mean, for Jerome Bettis, and you look at, like, you know, the road they had to go there that season. I mean, let's not forget where they lost the division eventually to the Cincinnati Bengals. The game back in early December, I mean, when we uh, looked at it, I mean, uh, for that time, I mean, right there, I mean, they lost that game uh, to the Bengals in 2005 uh, back on December 4th. 31 to 38, only to win out their final four regular season games, get in the playoffs, be a wild card, get even with the Bengals, who they just lost to, and then get even with a coach team who got, they got humiliated on Monday Night Football by 19 points, 7 to 26. And then they go face the Denver Broncos in Denver. I mean, this is, I mean, you're talking about a guy like Bill Cowher who's never won on the road as a head coach. 
up until that point. I mean, and the, the funny thing is, all these uh, games on the road he finally got happened that season. I mean, just think about that. I mean, in Cincinnati, in the RCA Dome against uh, Peyton Man and the Colts and, Tully, and some of Tony Dungy's defense right there. And then going to Denver, too, which is not an easy place, you know, in Mile High Stadium. Usually, like, a, a spot where a lot of players dread playing there, especially who's got asthma, uh, health issues, breathing conditions. I mean, just, just think about that for a second. I mean, Denver, I mean, just playing in that atmosphere, but on that stage. And you look at, like, the stuff that was combined right there. I mean, Jerome Bettis and Willie Parker, they combined for about 74 yards uh, rushing on the gar- ground, but it was mostly M. Rosberger. And that offense, ironically, in that game. And when you looked at that game right there where the Steelers defeated the Denver Broncos in the AFC uh, championship game, I mean, Beverly Rosberry completed uh, 21 out of 29 passes for 275 yards, two touchdowns and zero picks, only got sacked twice uh, for seven yards. And, I mean, just just wow. I mean, they were not to be denied, of course. Everyone knows what happened. Go Super Bowl in Detroit. Jerome Bez has a nice little presentation by the city of Detroit. Gives him the key to the city. As there was uh, teammates, the eve of the Super Bowl. And then Joey Poor and some of his teammates, too. I mean, aside from uh, many players just wearing the Notre Dame uh, jersey, too, including Troy Pabau, who's a USC guy, did that. I respect to Jerome Bez. But the nice little surprise they gave Jerome Best. Usually when they would run out as a team onto the field, they allowed Jerome Best to go out first and experience that moment uh, by himself for a few seconds to run out there. And then his teammates come join him. I mean, it was just what a rush. You had a sloppy game by Ben Rosberger. I mean, yes, I mean, in that game right there, I mean, the character that they had, I mean, only throwing for 123 yards, completed nine to 21 passes. I mean, only got sacked once, but I mean, the running game, I mean, it was definitely a huge part of that story right there too. I mean, of course, the biggest, uh, right there, the 70 plus yard uh, run by, uh, let's see, Fast Willie Parker, a uh, 75 yard run, excuse me, which I think is still the longest Super Bowl history, uh, which was helped by uh, guard, uh, Al Fanica in that game. I mean, it was just amazing. I mean, what they did. And for right there, I mean, speaking of which, too, I mean, those stories that guys like uh, that were told by Jerome Bettis, Al Fanica, Kendall Simmons, right there. I mean, there were a lot of guys who were dealing with some stuff like uh, off the field. I mean, as far as like health wise, too, uh, right now as we looked at, I mean, with that team, I mean, basically, uh, I mean, Al Fanca, he went through his career taking pills, I mean, f- pretty much for most of the day right there uh, to help control his epilepsy. And I heard that uh, for the very first time, courtesy of Dan Saber, and I didn't know that until I uh, interviewed him. And this was like uh, about less than a month out before the Hall of Fame would be announced, the eve of the Super Bowl, if Al Fanca was going to get in or not. And of course, uh, Bill Nunn, Bill Nunn as well. But still, I mean, when you look at it right there, I mean, like what he had to go through. I mean, and then uh, uh, Jerome uh, Best too. I mean, uh, having uh, some of uh, his issues going on right now. As uh, we looked at it, I mean, it, it was just definitely right there. I mean, some stuff. I mean, right now, I mean, it, and Jerome Bess, he used to ward off his asthma right there. I mean, he had some asthma conditions he was going through. And then uh, Kel Sims has to take shots in his uh, stomach during games to control his diabetes, which he was diagnosed following the 2002 season, so which began in 2003. I mean, you think about that. I mean, Jerome Bess was cool with saying, we were like a walking pharmacy in one regard, according to Bess. Uh, except from his home in Atlanta. It's crazy when you think about what each guy was dealing with. Obviously, all life-threatening issues. And uh, Simmons was saying, let me tell you, an offensive line coach, which, by the way, is Omar uh, Auburn, when I did my diabetes speaking 
that was one of the main points I made with people that helped get me through what I had to deal with. One of my best friends had epilepsy. He took his medicine consistently. If not, he would have a seizure and had to deal with that. And I watched Jerome have an asthma attack and have to use an inhaler. And this guy is a Hall of Fame running back. I mean, but still, I mean, you looked at some of the stuff right there, too. I mean, these guys did not want to use this as an excuse to, like, uh, go out there and perform and contribute as a unit. I mean, which really makes these guys truly men of steel, if you ask me. I mean, to do it for Jerome Bennis, of course, for their head coach, Bill Cower. I mean, and then also the ultimate uh, game, the one for the fun. So, Gaffler fifth Super Bowl, which tied with the 49ers and the Cowboys at that time before they won to win their six, three years later, to separate themselves from those two teams, which now they're tied with the Patriots, but whatever. But that's some awesome stuff right there. And I cannot wait to be down in Canton this summer to see that Hall of Fame induction ceremony right there. So, now let's go ahead and go wrap up with Fair Foul right now uh, on this edition here of the Mass Steel uh, podcast. Uh, as we look at it right now, CBS Sports, they ranked right now their uh, top 10 uh, coaches as far as like uh, going to the 2021 uh, season right here. As uh, we looked at it, I mean, CBS Sports uh, just uh, did this right now. And basically, they're ranked with uh, past performance and future outlook in mind. Not so much necessarily what they did on their career resume. I mean, just kind of like what they're doing going forward and just like recent from like their last season right now. Uh, Mike Tomlin, who's on this list right now, uh, he got in here at number 10. Uh, the guys uh, that are on this list prior to him, number one was Andy Reid of the Kansas City Chiefs, the number one team in the league despite falling in the Super Bowl uh, to Tom, Tom Brady and the Buccaneers, Pop Bay, you could say. And Bruce Arians and a good defense, a stellar defense, which by the way, and so a decent ground game. Uh, and then you had number two, Bill Belichick, despite going seven and nine, not being in the playoffs, first throughout Tom Brady, having a few key starters opt out due to COVID 19, and uh, going in a different direction of Cam Newton, a guy who was still having his issues at times and uh, struggling, but managed to pull through. I mean, they had a seven and nine record, but I mean, I mean, he gets to be viewed as number two team, uh, which I think was a little bit ridiculous. But at the same time, too, I mean, listen, I, mean, I think they're banking on the fact that now the COVID is kind of like phasing out. They could concentrate as a full unit right now. And I'd still like to see how that does versus Tom Brady. So far, Tom Brady's got the upper hand that with the Vince Lombardi Trophy. Uh, number three on here, you got John Harbaugh of the Baltimore Ravens, who uh, made his start to the second round of the playoffs, uh, losing to the Bills in Buffalo, going one and one, still finishing the season 11 and five, uh, to go to a 12 and six record overall. So he's the number th uh, third coach, followed by Sean Payton of the New Orleans Saints, who went 12 and four, uh, one and one in the playoffs to follow the Tom Brady and the Bucks in the divisional round at home which was ultimately proved to be uh, Drew Brees' last game in his NFL career, especially with the New Orleans Saints. He ret retired a few months later. Uh, followed by that, Sean McVay of the Buffalo Bills, he comes in at number five. And, of course, what he's been doing with Josh Allen, still got so a, a very stellar defense right now, uh, which, by the way, too, I mean, you look at him right now. I mean, look at their rankings uh, for the time being. They finished as the number two team in the league. Uh, second in points scored, second and number two uh, total yards uh, for offense. And on the flip side, too, I mean, their defense wasn't too bad either. I mean, 14th total defense. I mean, so you're still in the, among the playoff teams as far as being respectable. 16th in scoring defense. Not bad. I mean, so like I said, I mean, you're, you're winning the playoff bracket as far as the rankings go. So you're still like fairly like middle of the pack which is pretty darn good. I mean, pretty impressive, I would say. Uh, following uh, Sean McDermott at number five, you would have uh, Sean McVay of the LA Rams right there. Uh, and mainly because of their defense right there. I mean, their defense carried them into the playoffs thanks to eventual uh, defense player of the year uh, and Aaron Donald. I know a lot of Steeler Nation still feels like T.J. Watt got ripped off. I, mean, I can understand that. I have no problem with 
Aaron Donald again for the third time. He is that damn good, unfortunately. Sorry. I mean, listen, I, I know TJ Watt's numbers were statistically a lot better, but when you look at what he's doing, going grinding through the teeth of an offensive line to get to the quarterback and do what he does, be a disruptor, just a little bit more of extra and pressure on him to do what he does. I have no issue with it. Number one in total defense, number one in points defense. Uh, follow that, yeah, at number seven, Pete Carroll, the Seattle Seahawks. I'm fine with that, him being at seventh right there, 12 and four record, spike game bounce in the first round to the Rams in the wild card round in Seattle. Uh, followed by him, you got Bruce Arians at number eight, which I think should be a little bit higher. I think he deserves a little bit more respect than that. I mean, since he won the Super Bowl, I probably swap him out with uh, Sean McDermott at number five. I mean, honestly, I mean, you don't have Tom Brady. The Super Bowl run is not happening. They do not have that magical year like they're doing. It'll probably be like a stint, uh with the Cardinals and when he entered him as a coach with the Colts, to be honest with you. He's, he's not getting the chance without Brady. Plain and simple, and they're right there. But for going into this season, I'd swap him out with McDermott in a heartbeat. I give Bruce Jones that much respect. Uh, Matt LaFleur coming in right now, number nine. Uh, the same guy who Aaron Rodgers, who I think is scapegoating right now, uh, aside from Guna Coast right now, of the Packers GM. Uh, listen, uh, at the same time, too, I don't care how poorly executed those first three downs were trying to score for a touchdown to set up a two-point conversion to tie the game. I, I know you probably had to throw in the red flag and kick a field goal, but still – you do not tr- you do not dare and like leave that for chance for Tom Brady and the Bucks to convert a pair of first downs. Let's see what happens. Dumb call. No. So you know what? He deserves being that spot as good as the offense was. I mean, and mainly because of Aaron Rodgers. I mean, they had they were the third in uh total offense, fifth in scoring offense. I mean, with Matt LaFleur's uh rankings right here. I mean no, excuse me. Fifth and total offense, number one scoring offense. Then, of course, you got right now uh, after him, number 10, Mike Tomlin, who, by the way, again, win your first 11 games, but then in the last five games, going one and four, that game he beat the Colts, I think, from trailing by as many as 17 points, I want to say it was. Correct me if I'm wrong, to win that game, to hang on and Clinch and win the AFC North division. I mean, got embarrassed by the Browns in the playoffs. Just call it what it is. Despite the five turnovers by Ben Rosper. I mean, listen, uh, I can understand why he's at number 10, but I'm not sure if I will pull him that high. I will probably swap him out with Sean McVay, to be honest with you. Only because you won your division right there. I put him at least... Uh, for that part, of number uh, six, if not the top five, right there. But other than that, uh, fair or foul that he deserves to be at number 10. I'll say fair. I'd still pull him a little bit higher. But I can see why. And, he, I mean, people always continue to say he has a coach that hasn't had one losing season. He's getting past my Schartenheimer for the most consecutive seasons without – a losing season. And remember, it's only me, you're going to have a winning or a losing season. That's it. But for right now, no, I, I, I'm, I, I don't think so. So, yeah, you got, yeah, I really think about it too. I mean, listen, he is uh, one of rare coaches. I mean, who struggled since their last Super Bowl appearance. I mean, when you think about it. I mean, and it, it, it's not hard to do what he's doing. I mean, basically, I mean, still, but what when you really look at everything right now, I mean, from everything they they did and what they continue to do, I mean, going forward, I mean, it's uh, definitely... Interesting right now. And post Super Bowl records, by the way, too. I mean, when you look at it, most of the coaches all have losing records. 
I mean, you look at Mike Tomlin, he has been three and six. Andy Reid so far is the only one that's got a winning record on that, I think. And that's uh, 10 and nine since then. Then followed by Bill Cower in nine and five. I'm not sure if Andy Reid is at 500, but still. I mean, then you got uh, Tom Landry at five and six, Pete Carroll, five and six, as well as Mike McCarthy, five and six, Tom Payton, five and seven, Tom Coughlin, four and oh. I mean, made the playoffs one other time, only to win the Super Bowl. I mean, of course, you had some playoff droughts in between. I mean, for like four straight years before eventually just hanging it up and retiring. Don Sula, four and five. I mean, Vince Labari at three and oh. I mean, Vince Labari, I mean, what could we say? I mean, a Savat at the head coach. And then Dick Vermeule at three and two. But you got to look at it in today's era. Yes, I see the argument where you could be made that he's keeping his teams in contention. The problem is the way they've been finishing down the stretch. 2018, when you're at 7 2 and 1, I mean, you go, I mean, for the most part, at that point in time, 7 2 and 1, I think it is. Uh, let's double check that. I mean, that 2018 team, I mean, that where the wheels really started to fall off at that point. Yeah, seven, two, and one. And what they do, they go, for the most part, two and four. They finish nine, six, and one. 2019, I understand you're without Ben Roethlisberger. The defense was still carrying you. The running game was kind of sort of starting to figure out things down the stretch, still making some plays, almost pulled off the impossible, but still. I mean, when they are eight and five, needed at least three wins at the most, or at least two out of three with some help. They could have made the playoffs. Instead, they go 0 and 3 down the stretch. And then, of course, 1 and 4, ultimately 1 and 5, including the playoffs this past year. So that's the only reason why. I mean, Mike Tomlin, very damn good, respected coach. But like they always say, not always how you start, but how you finish. And we're going to finish this one up here on the Man of Steel podcast. Uh, thank everyone for who took the time to tune in. I'm going to come back Mondays and Wednesdays. I'm going to try and go transition to an hour show from 8 to 9 p.m. Sorry for starting just a little bit later. But uh, if you guys want to follow me, you can follow me on Twitter at Man of Steel CDR and on Instagram at Man of Steel Nation. I leave you. I'll be rolling. I'll be rolling here with Sir Zergo. I got